The title of the message today is, If You Feed Them, They Will Come. Mark chapter 6, the story of the feeding of the 5,000. My very first sermon that I ever wrote in Bible college was from the, from the, the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And it was called, All You Can Eat, All You Can Eat. It says this, the people saw them, uh, saw them going and many recognized them and ran together on foot from all the cities. And they got there ahead of them. And when Jesus went ashore, he saw a large, a large crowd and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He began to teach them many things when it was already quite late. The disciples came to him and said, it, it, the, this place is desolate and it's already quite late. Send them away into the Send them away that they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. And Jesus answered, and I love this. Look up here real quick. Look up here. I love this part. This is my favorite part. They're like, Jesus, come on, man. There's so much going on right now. March Madness. I want to get home and watch TV. We're tired. It's late. We ain't got no money. Send these people to Mount Dora to get Walmart and they can get whatever they want. And Jesus said, you give them something to eat. You know, I've pondered this, these questions. Why does God continue to send these huge crowds to Umatilla, Florida? And all I can say is, we must be feeding people. We must be providing something that's ministering to an emptiness in their heart and, 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 a, and, a, and a spot in their soul. And it goes on to say this. They said, shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread? Inflation must have been ridiculous. And he said, he said, how many loaves do we have? Go look. And when they found out, they said five and two fish. And he commanded them to sit down by groups on the green grass. And they sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties. And they took the five loaves and the two fish looking up towards heaven. He blessed the food and broke the loaves. And he kept giving them to the disciples to set before them and divided up the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. This is like your second round on Thanksgiving day, your second serving. And then you got to your recliner and you've got your remote control in this hand and your soul and your stomach have been satisfied. <laughs> What, what, the reason why that verse is there is because the Lord wanted all of us to know nobody got gypped that day. They all had plenty to eat. They were, they were made uh, full in that moment. And it goes on to say this, that at the very end, what? They all ate and were satisfied. They picked up 12 full baskets of broken pieces and also of the fish. And there were 5,000 men who ate that day. 5,000, 5,000. Now here's what, this is important. If you've been raised in church, you know this. If you haven't been raised in church, maybe this is helpful. In scripture, many times, families were listed based upon the head of the household. And so in this case, they gave a number. Well, how many people were there? I don't know, but we had at least 5,000 men. Now, culturally speaking, during that time, people had more children than we do today. All right? It was like, it was like a, 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 you know, a busload of Braswells back then. And so we think historically, when you look at the culture, that if there was 5,000 men, that there was potentially a wife and maybe a child or children, at least 15,000 people that were fed that day from five loaves and two fish. But let me ask you this. Does it really matter if it was 50 or 50,000? The miracle was still just as real that Jesus provided in the way that he did. Today, I just want to offer up um, three, three ways to keep them coming. Three ways that we can keep them coming. Number one, you got to show your heart. You got to show your heart. Verse 33, the people saw them going and many recognized them and they ran together on foot from all the cities and they got there ahead of them because they knew the 11 o'clock service would be there shortly after. <laughs> and Jesus went ashore and he saw the large crowd and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. You know what I love about Jesus is he saw the crowd and he saw an opportunity. He saw the crowd and he didn't turn the other way. He saw the crowd and he said, here we go. He saw the crowd and he knew it was a great moment for ministry to take place. He, he shared his heart. He didn't see the crowd and see all the burdens that come with a big crowd. He didn't see the crowd and say, you know what? This is going to be difficult to minister to all these people. He didn't see the crowd and say, Lord knows we don't have enough peppermints in the four-year for all these people. He saw the crowd and he said he had, the Bible says, he had compassion for them for they were like sheep 
without a shepherd. And he knew that his heavenly father had called him the son of God to seek and save that which is lost. He is the good shepherd that comes to minister to those who are lost and weary. Listen, we live in a world where people can tell if you're genuine or if you're a phony. They just can. People can tell if you're trying to be some slick car salesman. Sorry, dad. <laughs> my dad was a used car salesman for, for uh, most, of my, uh, most of my life. He's in heaven now. But I can tell you this about my dad. He was a horrible car salesman. In the sense of being a slick car salesman. My dad was almost at times a little bit rude to people. He's like, all right, you want it? Here's the keys. Go test drive it. I don't care. Well, what can you tell me about it? It's a car. Get out there, all right? <laughs> if you don't fire up, call me. I'll bring the jump box out. I'm like, dad, seriously? You trying to sell these people? I don't care. The world, the world just knows. They know if your heart's in something or if they're not. You ever, you, anybody ever gone through a fast food drive through <laughs> Everybody that serves in a fast food drive, drive through are the most pleasant people you've ever met in your life. Matter of fact, they absolutely love what they do until you show up. And it is like, man, have a nice day. When you are genuine, when you show your heart, when you're real with people, when you're vulnerable at times, people gravitate towards that. And the reason why the Bible says that people literally came from all the cities on foot, I might add. So don't be crying about trying to find a parking spot today. They came on foot is because they wanted to be near Jesus because they knew his heart. They, they were hearing about him. They wanted to be a part of the things that he was a part of. People gravitated towards that genuine, compassionate spirit that he had. You know, I often feel like I never get to catch up. I, I made a statement to somebody this week, how you doing, how can I pray for you? And, and, I, and I say this in all sincerity. I, I, feel, I feel like, Many days, I'm barely keeping my head above water. I'm just being fully transparent with you today. And, and I'm, not, I'm not to say that I'm the only one. Anybody doggy paddling through this world? And you know, anybody, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like in the busyness of ministry and life, it's like a conveyor belt that never stops. Anybody ever seen that I Love Lucy episode? My mind just went there. You can't stop. Why? Because if you stop, what happens? Everything backs up. And the busyness of this, of this journey and the large crowd and, and the busyness of what a large crowd can bring can hold people back. But Jesus didn't see it that way. Jesus saw it as a ministry opportunity. He saw people with his heart. He wanted to minister to their soul. He was teaching. He was serving. He was healing. All that he was doing was trying to come alongside people on their journey. And I think for us, sometimes we just get wrapped up in the grind that we think it's a burden. Yesterday, myself, um, AJ, um, in the back in the sound booth, we, we did two services together here. We had a very small time in between. Um, we met up in the sound booth and we're chatting a little bit. He was eating a beef stick and a string cheese. I had just got done eating a, like a sausage that I had cooked last night. We didn't have a whole, a whole lot of time in between services, so it was kind of like a, a quick power lunch. But I want you to know, Jesus lived the same life. Look at verse 30. Look, this is interesting says this in verse 30 of the same chapter. The apostles gathered together with Jesus and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a secluded place and let's rest a while. For there were many people coming and going and then they didn't even have time to eat. So guess what, preacher boy, Brooks Braswell? You think, you're, you think the struggle is unique to you? Jesus walked the same walk. Yet when he saw the crowd, he didn't run the other way. Can I tell, can I tell you something real quick? Go ahead and say yes. Because I'm going to anyhow. <laughs> there are people today filling this building that could have the opportunity to go to many other places. But they're choosing not to go because maybe they've already been at some time and they realize 
They're not feeding me. They're not feeding me. Feeding people is about ministering to someone's soul. It's about providing for them, showing your heart, allowing them to see that you care for them. When Jesus saw the crowd, he didn't judge. He he didn't turn the other way. He showed his heart. Why? They were like sheep without a shepherd. We got to show our heart. Number two, we got to feed their soul. Verse 34. This is what it says. He felt compassion for them. For they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. He began to teach them many things. Can you imagine hanging out with Jesus every day? You literally realize that everything he said was a sermon, right? I mean, every word that Jesus spoke had the potential of ending up being in here. Now, they didn't realize that. Now, can you imagine if your daddy was a preacher? And you're in a car with him for 18 hours going to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And everything he sees on the side of the road is a sermon illustration. Let me tell you, dad, I really try not to be that guy. I don't want to be that dad that everybody's like, well, kids, let me tell you. In the gospel of John, dad, can we just go to the bathroom? (laughs) Jesus, as he ministered to people, his desire was to minister to their soul before he met all their physical needs. Look at this. Jesus knew that he was going to feed the 5,000. He knew that was coming. But he also knew that there was a ministry that needed to take place first. And so it says that as the crowd came to him, they weren't coming for a fish fry. They didn't come for an all-you-can-eat buffet. It says that they were following him from other cities, and he began to teach them many things. Give a man a fish, feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime. So for us, if all we do is minister the physical needs of people, they will run dry again. But if we teach people that they can tap into the well, Jesus Christ, they will have living water flowing through their lives. Amen? This new crowd of people, every time Jesus saw it as an opportunity. Do you notice throughout the New Testament how Jesus would focus on the spiritual needs of a person first? Luke chapter 5, the story of the paralytic. His buddies put him on a stretcher. They picked him up. They carried him uh, to the building where Jesus was speaking. But it was the 930 service and they couldn't get in. So they literally climbed up on the roof of the building. They removed these, these, uh, these um, panels up there. And they, I mean, it, it's, it's mind-blowing to think that this could happen in the middle of a service. But they literally lowered their buddy. Can you imagine their friend? But guys, I'm lame, but I'm not dead, okay? Don't drop me. They lowered him down in front of Jesus. And Jesus saw the man. It's evident that he's lame. And Jesus said... Uh, friend, your sins are forgiven you. And immediately this group of people say, whoa, 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 who in the world except God alone has the power to forgive sins? And Jesus said, just so you know, the son of man has authority to forgive sins. That was one of my Bible verses, just so you know. He said, let me, let me show you right now. He told that man, get up, pick up your stretcher and walk. And that man stood up that day. Not only were his sins forgiven first, But the Lord said, I got the power for him to be healed just the same. Can you imagine that day? Can you imagine that crowd? It was so packed. It was so tight. You couldn't even get in the building. And I guarantee you that dude was doing cartwheels down the aisle when he walked up out of that building. Jesus wanted to minister to the individual soul before anything else. The Gospel of John, chapter 9, the man that was born blind. What did the Lord do? Did he just say, poof, receive your sight? No. No. The Bible says he anointed his eyes, and then he told him, go and wash. That man literally had to walk by faith in the midst of his blindness with this clay over his eyes and go into this pool and wash as he did, and the Lord ministered to him that day. Why do people continue to come back to this place? Why why does God continue to open the door for ministry here at the church the way that he does? Because people are hungry. And God's using us to feed them. We live in a weary world. There is an emptiness. I hope you realize this. And this this is for all of us in this room. But some of you might feel like this is just for you. All of us start off this life 
with a empty spot in our soul that only Jesus can fill. And most people will spend most of their lives trying to fill that emptiness with the things of the world. And it'll never satisfy you. It'll never fill that emptiness. But Jesus Christ himself, if you put your trust and faith in him, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. That was one of my verses. <laughs> Ministering to a, person, um, to a person's heart will last them a whole lot longer than ministering to a person's stomach. I can promise you that. Lastly, not just feed their soul, we got to meet their needs. Verse 35, this is what it says. When it was already quite late, the disciples came to him. They said, the place is desolate, and it's already quite late. Send them away so they may go into the, into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. And these words that just ministered to my heart, Jesus said, you give them something to eat. People always ask me, Pastor Brooks, why do you say yes? Why do you say yes so much? You know, I, I was in a leadership meeting a number of years ago, and that, you know, I, I learned something. And I'm not saying that. I'm not saying I'm perfect, okay? Listen, but hey, if you say yes to somebody, you're saying no to somebody else. And, and, and I get it. When you say yes uh, and you make yourself available, you, you, can, you can feel like you can't keep your head above water. But I'm mindful of the ministry of Jesus. That even when they got away, they just got away from the crowd. And he said, guys, let's take a quick second. Somebody bring some beef jerky over here. Let's get a snack. But Jesus knew the second that he was done with that rest, there was a crowd of people waiting. But he didn't see it as a burden. He saw it as a blessing. He saw it as an opportunity. Uh, the Bible says in the Gospel of John that, that, that he told the, the, the people that, at the woman of the well in the Gospel of John chapter 4 that my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. What he's saying is serving the Lord fills my soul and restores my spirit. We need to meet people's needs. This is a crucial moment in the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Crucial. If you, hey, point number one today, it was okay. All right, point number two, average. Point number three, about to blow you out of the water. So I hope I get a couple amens and mean it. We always hear about Jesus with the feeding of the 5,000. We always hear the story of the little boy, Gospel of John chapter 6, the lad that had five loaves and two fish. But how often do we really hear about the role of the disciples? Maybe, and I, and I, I want you to ponder this thought. My personal thought is that the ministry was not for the multitude. The ministry was, the, excuse me, the miracle was not for the multitude. The miracle was for the disciples. I believe that the disciples formed a committee. Matter of fact, if they were part of a Baptist church, they probably formed a committee on committees, which is the dumbest committee in the world. It's a committee for the committees. We're crazy. There are no committees in heaven. Mark that down. Amen? Okay, I figured I'd get an amen for some of you on that one. And, and, and the disciples got together and said, look, here's the deal. All right, here, here. Are you, look, somebody's got to be the spokesman. Somebody's going to have to talk to Jesus. Brooks, let me tell you, you're good at words. Will you go and talk to the Lord? And, and, and they're telling, we've got to go in there. We've got to persuade him. It is late. We are tired. Man, we've been out here all day long. We don't know these people. I mean, you realize we do not have the money. There's no way. We can't afford to build a 1,300-seat sanctuary. Why in the world would we do something like that? We don't have the money to feed these people. Somebody go over there and tell Jesus. And one of them walks up and says, hey, Jesus, can we send these people away? And Jesus said, you give them something to eat. Oh, I love it. I don't know why you don't love it the way I love it. I'm loving that part. What he's saying is, guys, you'll, listen, this is important. You are about to miss a miracle. Can I tell you something that will stop you from experiencing miracles? Excuses, excuses, excuses. Pastor Brooks, if you knew how, how busy I am, <laughs> Pastor Brooks, the reason why we quit coming to the church is there's just so many people. You know what my response is to those people? Well, you're going to hate heaven. 
I tell them too. Well, the crowd and everything. Oh yeah, you, you want to say, I'm, I'm about to get sideways here just so y'all know, okay? It's the same person that tells me that, that I'll walk into Walmart and see them. And I'm like, dude, I'm a... I was in the flesh a little bit there. Lord, forgive me for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. <laughs> what Jesus was wanting them to realize is, I'm about to do something big. And because you're tired, because you're weary, because you're focused on what you don't have as opposed to what you do have, you're going to miss it. The miracle was for the disciples. And, and, and they got there together. Can you imagine being the first disciple to get the broken pieces? And he's got his basket. He's like, oh my goodness, this is going to be so embarrassing. Here, we got five loaves, and I'm the first guy, and he goes out. Jesus fills his basket, and he goes out there, and he hits the first row of people, and he turns back around, and when he turns back around, Jesus has like 20 tables overflowing with scraps of food. Can I give you another verse that I studied? Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. What Jesus was wanting them to realize is if you stand next to the vine, you will always bear fruit. If you stand next to the source of water, you will never run dry. If you stay connected to me, you will always have power flowing through you. You give them something to eat. So First Baptist Church of Umatilla, here's what I want you to know. Quit making excuses for not being able to serve the Lord. Well, you know what, Pastor? I've had a season in my life where I've grown to an age. I'm in retirement now, and I just don't feel like I've got the energy and strength to do those types of things. You know, can I tell you this? The Awana ministry. Your first night in Awana, if you serve in kids' ministry, if you will commit to at least two weeks, that's two nights. Your first night, you'll get to the car, and you'll be like this. And you'll probably, the devil will probably, I don't know if I can do it again. There's so many kids. It was fun and it was great, but I don't know if I have the energy. And that next Wednesday night, you show up in the building. One of those kids runs up to you. And they wrap their arms around your leg. And they give you a big old hug. And they tell you how grateful that they are to see you again. And you watch one of those kids as you're a listener and they're trying their best to quote John 3, 16. And you realize in that moment, the miracle is right in front of you. But your excuses hold you back from that. Serving over at Helping Hands, you know, offering food and assistance to people. I don't know. I mean, don't they already have enough people over there, Pastor Brooks? I mean, don't they have a system in place? I don't want to mess up. I mean, the bereavement thing. I mean, I could come up maybe. I could come up and make some banana pudding. I don't know. I could do this. Quit talking yourself out of doing the things that God is wanting you to do. I'll give you a couple thoughts uh, in closing. How many, how many of you truly are missing the miracles that God has for you because of your own excuses? And lastly, today after this service, you're going to have an opportunity to walk through uh, this new sanctuary. It's not complete, still a construction site. Some of you that have been in construction, you could go in there today and you could say, well, you know, if I was to build it this way, I wouldn't have done it that way. Can I just give you, can you just, bear, can you just walk in with a different feel, Okay. This is, this is the house of the Lord. Yes, spiritually speaking, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the house of the Lord. But this 161 years ago, that's a long time. A group of people prayed in North Lake County, God, give us a vision for the future. Were any of you there then? <laughs> we, we, we are reaping the benefits of, of their prayers and their sacrifice and their giving. And you know what we have the opportunity to do? We have the, we have the opportunity to look ahead and start praying for what's to come. Listen, you're going to walk in there today? You'll see the, the, the main commons area, like the large foyer. But when you peek your head in the sanctuary, can I just tell you what you're going to do? I'll just, can I tell you? Okay, I'm going to. You're going to it's like walking into a Bucky's for the very first time. <laughs> but there's no brisket. 
yet if you feed them we can become a mega church overnight <laughs> you're gonna walk in there and you're gonna be like in that moment we offer up this prayer God let this place Let this place be a house that ministers to a hungry soul. And I'm just going to tell you right now, I know without a shadow of a doubt, you're going to look at all those seats, you're going to say, good Lord, how in the world are we going to fill these things up? Don't blink your eyes two times, because I guarantee you right now, all the Lord is waiting for is for us to open those doors and expand this parking lot, and people are coming. You want to know why? If you feed them, they will come.